This is how not to put out a chip pan fire, using water. To explain the secrets of firefighting, I went to see Chief Fire Officer Barry Browning at the Foley Oil Refinery. For a fire to exist, we need three elements, and they are oxygen, heat energy, and fuel vapour. And if you remove one, the fire goes out, right? Absolutely right. If you remove one, the fire goes out. So in the case of the chip pan, what should we do? We should have smothered the chip pan either with the use of a fire blanket or the correct type of fire extinguisher. Yeah, that, that would take the air away. That would certainly take the air away. Right. I see you've got three different types of fire extinguisher lined up here. What's the difference between them? For a material fire, one that we require to remove the heat side of our fire triangle, we use water. Yep. And this is a water extinguisher. Excellent. Very simple and straightforward. What's the other two? For flammable liquid fires, again, to remove the oxygen side of the triangle, we use dry chemical. And th that's a thick cloud. I've seen one work, and it just completely wipes the air out of the way. Yes, it, it does. It... Yep. And a little one at the end. Carbon dioxide, primarily for use on electrical fires. Yep. It can be used, however, on flammable liquid fires, but is not anywhere near so successful. It does the same thing. It replaces the oxygen around the fire. It, it does, yes. So, water extinguishes fire by removing the heat from the fire. This breaks the fire triangle and the fire goes out. Dry powder and carbon dioxide extinguishers work by removing the air from a fire by smothering it. This breaks a different side of the fire triangle and again the fire can go out. Well, Barry, I know that to demonstrate the different types of fire extinguisher, you've got something lined up for us. Yes, and the first demonstration is to show a wood fire. The first thing we tried was smothering the fire with carbon dioxide. It seemed to be working, but the fire kept leaping up again. In the open air, the blanket of carbon dioxide kept getting blown away and the oxygen was getting back in, so remaking the fire triangle. Now, the proper way to put this fire out is to remove the heat from the triangle using water. This cools the fire down permanently. What we'd like to show you now is a fire involving liquid LPG propane, or perhaps, as you would know, camping gas. Look at what happens if you add water to this fire. A lethal fireball. That's because even cold water is much hotter than liquid propane, and you're actually adding heat. The way to put this fire out is to use the right kind of smothering agent, which is a blanket of dry powder. The next demonstration we'd like to pass on to is the final isolation of fuel, removing the, again referring to the fire triangle, removing the fuel source. This is gas burning under pressure. The hoses are turned on not to put out the fire, but to provide a cool, safe area for the firemen to approach the fuel valve. With no fuel to feed it, the fire goes out. So having completed our little exercises, here's a little exercise for you to solve. This drum is half filled with burning petrol. A strong blast of carbon dioxide puts it out. This drum is filled to the brim. In this case, the carbon dioxide fails to put the fire out. The question we want to ask you is... Why?
is two and a half meters of glass tubing that David Jones has set up for us. What are you trying to show us here, David? To show you how flames travel. Here, well, here's one. So you've got a long tube here that's filling full of gas. It's filling from this end, and when it reaches this end, the flame here lights it. It's going to light it, and then... Now, what is it that's actually causing the explosion? Well, as the flame burns through the gas, there's more and more hot gas behind it, and less and less cold gas in front of it. So the hot gas pushes the cold gas faster, faster and faster, till it reaches the speed of sound. And an explosion is simply a flame travelling at speed of sound, so it makes a sound. It's like Concorde going through the sound barrier. Yes, now, you wouldn't think, really, that a flame could travel at all. A flame seems a very stationary thing. That's right, but I can show you that it does travel by means of this apparatus. OK, there's a flame, and by lifting it off, it can't get through the gauze, so it can't travel back to the burner where it would like to go. And you can, in fact, well, take the flame right off. It can't travel back to its nozzle. So you can try that with different sorts of meshes, and by moving it up and down, you get different effects, don't yes. you? Well, perhaps that's something that you could try as well. Did you know that space rockets use gases as fuel? Hydrogen and oxygen. In fact, lots of people think that maybe hydrogen is the fuel of the future. Mike Stevens, is hydrogen a good fuel? Well, it certainly is, Terry. And we can demonstrate that very well by lighting some. We've oh, got a so. balloon full up here. Yeah. And so I'm going to let you ignite it. OK. Would you like right. to stand back? Don't want to get too close to it. That was quite good, wasn't it? <laughs> I don't know how safe that looks either. <laughs> well, it's as safe as any other fuel, so long as you know how to handle it properly. In fact, actually, people are really rather worried about the fact that uh, petrol and oil might be disappearing, so perhaps hydrogen may be the answer. It certainly could be. And a plentiful supply, of course, is from water. Yes. It's this made is... up of hydrogen and oxygen, and we've got a little gadget here. This is just water with a little drop of acid in it, is it? That's right, and we're passing an electric current through, so we're splitting the water into its component parts, hydrogen and oxygen. You can see the bubbles there of hydrogen and oxygen, and they're coming along this tube down here into some ordinary washing-up liquid. We should get quite a little crack from this one. Shall I switch that off? Yes, please. I'll stand well away. <laughs> Very good. And that was only really quite a small amount, wasn't it? That was only quite a tiny amount. Yeah. We've got a much larger scale version up here in this balloon. And I see the ear defenders there. <laughs> yes, you're certainly going to need these. And we're going to get a larger scale bang out of it. <laughs> we should do. You ready? Yeah. So hydrogen and oxygen together make a very good fuel. They certainly do. And we've already got prototype cars running off of hydrogen as a fuel. And so long as we can find a nice, cheap and efficient way of splitting water, hydrogen could be the fuel of the future. Thanks very much, Mike. Well, I dare say most of us are familiar with the old Bunsen burner and you probably think there's not much about them to know. But to prove us all wrong, we've got Steve Hammond here from British Gas. Right then, Steve, tell us about Bunsen's. Well, let's have a close look at this Bunsen flame. You can see that there are two parts to its structure. There's a bright blue inner cone mm -hmm. and also what we call an outer mantle. Now, it is possible to separate the two parts of the Bunsen flame using this apparatus here. Yeah, just lose that one. Off you go. Now, what we've got is a Bunsen burner supplying this glass tube here. And what I'm going to do is to set up the Bunsen flame on the top. You can see another glass tube down the outside here with a bung in the bottom, which I can raise up slowly and actually separate the inner cone from the outer mantle like that. And just to prove that there is a flame there at the top, I can colour it. Oh, yeah, just about. So, in fact, that shows us two separate reactions going on, one down there and one at the top. That's right, yes. Right. 
Now, I know those are both examples of what you call stable flames. Can you show us an unstable flame, please, Dean? Yes, we can. Uh, if we fill up that uh, glass tube along the front of the bench yeah. with the gas-air mixture, then I can ignite it and we'll watch the flame travel down. Right, that's this tap here. I'll put this on, then. Here we go. <laughs> it's on. That should be about it. Superb is that. Listen, apart from that really wonderful noise, what are we witnessing happening there? Well, as you saw, the flame was unstable, but it also uh, travelled with a certain speed. Yeah. And that flame speed, as we call it, is very important when you're designing a burner. Right, well, you've got two Bunsen burner models here, just to explain. This here is like a Bunsen burner, the gas comes in the bottom, this section lets a bit of air get in, as in a normal Bunsen, then the mixture burns at the top. Anyway, Steve, let's see. <clears throat> Well, let's have a look what happens when we supply the mixture too fast. In other words, at, at a speed greater than the flame speed. Right. You see, the flame is unstable. Yes. And it's lifting off. I agree. Alternatively, if we supply the gas at a speed too low, in other words, lower than the flame speed, yep. then the flame can burn back into the burner. <laughs> now, the flame at the moment is stable, but as I turn the flow down, it gradually becomes more and more unstable and eventually will pop back into the burner itself. See? I see. If you wanted to stabilise that, presumably you just turn the gas flow up a little bit faster. That's right. Right. How can you stabilise that one? Well, there are three main ways of doing that. First of all, we can take a flame that itself is stable and hold that next to the burner. And see? We've got a nice flame that's actually anchored in position. So that little flame can actually hold the big one steady? It can, yes. Right. Alternatively, we can take a cup and put that over the top of the burner. Now, what's happening there is that no longer are we getting cold air coming in and extinguishing the flame, and also we're getting recirculation zones, which help to stabilise the flame. I see, yes. There's one last method that we can use, and that's putting the bar in the flame. There we go. Oh, yes. Oh, no. And again, we get stabilisation from recirculation, but this time the recirculation zones are along the edge of the bar. So, actually, it works on the same theory as the collar that you put on earlier. That's right, yes. Right, then. Now, I see that I've been flickering away in the middle, and it's not just a pretty effect, Steve. What's that going to show us? Well, so far, all the flames that we've looked at have been of gas burning in air. Yeah. It is possible to turn that round and burn air in gas. Right. And this uh, is an experiment that I wouldn't recommend that you try for yourself. <laughs> I don't think I was going to. We put our glasses on, it could be a little bit lively, this one, apparently. <laughs> right, what we've got here is natural gas being supplied through this wide glass tube, and it's burning off at the top. Inside, we've got uh, a narrow steel tube through which I can pass a flow of air. And you can see that we get a bright flame inside a the little flame separate already flame, burning. yes. Now, just to prove to you that I can burn air in gas, I can pull that down inside the atmosphere of gas. Right, so what you're saying is that little flame in there is actually the air that we breathe, but burning because it's got a gas envelope around it. That's right. It's, it's like the flame at the top, but inside out, really. Exactly. Oh, I see, that's tremendous. In other words, it's the same reaction going on between air and gas. It doesn't matter which one's inside the other. Well, good. Well, we seem to have got through that quite safely. Take the glasses off now. What else have you got unusual to show us then, Steve? <clears throat> Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think it'd be possible to burn a Bunsen burner on the moon, say, if you had a supply of gas? Well, no, I think everybody knows that you actually need oxygen and the moon hasn't got an atmosphere. That's right. Well, if we actually supply oxygen along with the gas to our burner, then we can burn it almost anywhere, including underwater. So that's gas and oxygen mix, mix now coming out of that nozzle, isn't it? That's right. Right. the New York Hall of Science in front of a huge Atlas rocket, which is the same sort of rocket that took John Glenn into space in 1961. And we're looking at some model rockets. Dr. Alan Friedman, you know a lot about these model rockets, don't you? Well, I'm a physicist. And one reason to become a physicist is that you get to play with model rockets and sometimes big rockets and call it work at the same time. So how do these model rockets get up into the air, then? Well, the energy to propel these rockets comes from little chemical engines like this. There's a fast burning chemical inside and a ceramic nozzle to direct the burning gases outward. 
There must be quite a lot of energy in this, though, must there? Well, it's enough to produce a few pounds of force, and the models only weigh a few ounces, but actually it's no more energy than you would get from burning a Sunday newspaper. The difference is that in this case, the burn is very controlled and very rapid, so that all the energy comes out the tail. Instead of, if you burn the newspaper in a fireplace, the energy goes up in heat in all directions. Well, shall we try lighting one just to see how much energy sure. there is then? We've got one set up in a test stand here, and if you would attach those wires, and we're going to fire it as if it were going down into the ground. The exhaust will come up. We'll get a good view of it then. Right. And we need these wires because it's very hard to set it off. Deliberately for safety requires an electrical charge at just the right place. Okay. Okay. We're armed. When you press the button, it'll go. Three, two, one, zero. Whoa, that was pretty good, wasn't it? Right. Now, wait. There. See the second charge? That was the ejection charge. In the rocket, it would force gases up into the body of the rocket, which will pop out the nose cone and release the parachute for a nice controlled descent down to the Earth. So let's launch the rocket then, shall we? All right. Three, two, one, zero. Woo! Oh, oh that was, here it oh. comes, here it comes. Oh, look. And here they all are, they work just like the real thing. Now they come in kit form and are made out of plastic and cardboard to make them light. And they range from quite simple ones to really complicated ones. I just love this. I've got to show you this. Look, this rocket goes up and it parachutes down, but the space shuttle detaches and glides off on its own. It's superb. And then there's this one. It's even got a camera in it so you can get a photograph of your roof. They're all great fun. I'm, I'm down to have a go. You have to try it as well. <laughs> Yeah, well, as you might imagine, I'm not having a lot of luck trying to set fire to this piece of aluminium foil. But someone who can burn aluminium is Steve Hamlin. Go on, Steve, what do you do? Well, aluminium in powdered form will burn quite readily. And I've got a tube with some aluminium here, which I'm going to blow into the flame. And let's see how readily it'll burn. Well, the, the reason your screen went a bit dark is that we've had to adjust the electronics in the studio so that the flash didn't damage our cameras and your TV sets. That's how bright it was. Uh, Steve, have you got any other metals that you can burn in that way? Yes, certainly. Powdered zinc will burn in the same way. Ooh, it's rather nice, is that? Now, does it have any practical applications, this uh, powdering things? Yes, it does. In fact, in power station boilers, coal is burned in powdered form to produce steam, which then gives us our electricity. Right. And I can show you how cleanly carboniferous dust will burn by blowing this into the flame. That's tremendous. Steve, thanks very much indeed for coming in. That shows you that if things are powdered, they burn much better than if they're in solid blocks. We're all used to modern small cameras with the little handy electronic flashes, but not so long ago, you had to use a thing like this. <laughs> it seems a bit cumbersome, but that's nothing compared to this invention which was painted in the 1870s. To tell us about it is Mike Stevens. Mike, what have you got in your glass tube there? Well, all we've got is a mixture of a gas, nitric oxide, and a solvent called carbon disulfide. Yeah? Is it dangerous? Well, when it was first performed in France, it killed three people in the front row of the audience. Well, I can see you're going to light it now, so I'm just going to retire <laughs> a little bit, Mike. I've got a cow. Well, we'll be, we'll be a little bit safer today. <laughs> Here we go. Whoa! 